Hey everyone, welcome to another video. Now today I'm doing something very different to my usual content. I've had a lot of requests within the Discord community asking me things like, Curtis, can you just do a video explaining your thought process on the game, your take on the meta, and a range of different topics that you don't really get the opportunity to cover within your guides? So I thought today would be a really great time to do it because my internet's kind of screwed and I can't make any gameplay footage for a while. So hopefully you guys will still enjoy it. Any feedback is greatly appreciated, guys. So what we're going to cover today, guys, is a range of different topics. The first one is the Season 10 current mid-meta and how it's actually evolving. And there has been this conundrum or this problem in my mind for the past few weeks, which is basically all revolving around what is the most effective way to climb in solo queue and what specific champions are best to play. So I want to kind of break down my thought process and engage in that dialogue with you guys in the comment section and hear my opinion out. I want to hear your opinion and we can go back and forth maybe within the comments or within the Discord. The second one, deep dive on differing styles like the aggressive Roma, scaling assassins, scaling mages. I'll go in deep, deep into this as well. Then we're going to cover a four-step champion pool creation process because I wasn't really happy with my previous champion pool video and I've had a lot of questions about champion pool stuff. So I thought I'd kind of go over that again. Um, fourth here, I'm going to be talking a little bit about optimizing for drafts and the importance of knowing bands. And lastly, just my thoughts on one tricking in general because I do get that question a lot as well. So let's start off guys by talking a little bit about the season 10 mid meta. Now, I personally believe we are in the midst of one of the most balanced seasons of League of Legends for a mid laner ever. In my past 9 or 10 years of playing the game, I cannot recall a more balanced season than the, than the one we are in right now. So what I've actually done, I've gone ahead and taken a screenshot of the recent match history of Showmaker and Xiaohu. Now these are two of the most successful Korean solo queue players at the current moment. I believe Xiaohu has been rank 1 a lot this entire season. He's consistently top 5, top 10 at least. And Showmaker's got like 3 accounts that are nearly top 10 as well. Like he's an absolute beast. Now I've actually kept up to date with all the pro players in EU and Korea specifically and always been looking at their match histories. But I've seen the same thing. There's no trends. There's no trends in the types of champions they're playing. Let's just take a look here. We've got, when have we ever seen a player play Twisted Fate, Corky, Cassidy, Pantheon Mid, Syndra, and Zoe in just in the last one day? They, they, they play that many differing style of champions in just one day. Usually what you see in a meta is that there's at least a common trend of champions that they think are the strongest for climbing solo queue or that are really good for competitive. Now, exactly the same on the right-hand side. We've got Vlad, Twist of Fate, Zoe, Syndra, Lucian, Lissandra, LeBlanc, Kiana, and all of them are viable. You can't make a real big argument to say that any of them aren't viable. They're all good in certain games. So this says to me that we are in a very balanced meta and there are certain situations that call for all of these types of champions and you can carry with all of these sorts of champions. So this is going to lead me to a bit later on the conundrum or the problem that I've been dwelling over the, for the past month or so um, about what is the best way to climb as a solo queue player in season 10? What sort of champions should you play? Because in other seasons, it's been really obvious, but in this season, it hasn't really been the case. So let's move on a little bit. So what I've done here, guys, is attempted to break down the Season 10 mid-meta evolution. And it is a lot here. Don't worry, I'm going to break it down step by step. But I really feel this all started at the end of last year when FPX won Worlds. So what we saw at Worlds was that Doin B had this very unique push and move style that no one really played before. Everyone was playing for lane, playing for scaling, playing for team fights. But what Doin B realized is that if I just play you know, Galio or Rumble, or when I do play Rise, I just push and move and dive sides with my jungler. We can just stomp games. We get every objective. We can dive sides. We can push the pace of the game beyond what other, you know, other teams were comfortable playing. Now, what I, what, what I believe happened is in that off season, teams like C9, who actually versed FPX at Worlds, who went to these Korean boot camps, were inspired by that. And they realized, wait, if teams just play this very immobile scaling approach, we can just end the game by getting Rift Heralds as they spawn, stack dragons, dive sides, play the game at such a fast pace, use that game understanding and threat level understanding to just win games super, super quick. And in an interview with C9's Ven, he literally said the same thing. He said, Niski and me, we got really, you know, inspired by the way FPX played the game at Worlds. I watched all their Pro View VODs. 
And so that he kind of, especially Niski, he kind of shifted his identity from being a scaling mid lane mage player to this aggressive rumble or threat oriented push and move style player. So what we saw was, you know, people from going from Orianna, Rise, and Cassio to more of this rumble. We saw a lot of Lucian mid, a lot of Kiana mid, because Kiana mid has so much threat. And it's not that Kiana can necessarily just get pushed and moved by herself, but combined with the correct junglers, like I've got here on the right-hand side, Elise, Rek'Sai, Lee Sin, and we saw Tien play a lot of these champions at Worlds. You can generate so much threat, so these guys have to respect, and then you get so much room, you stack dragons... All these champs are great at dragons fights, you get so much priority, and the side lanes basically can't play the game. So then what happened, I believe, is that the meta shifted a little bit. And we'll get into this, like this little transition here to here, this, this section here, is less about what happened in the mid lane and more what happened in other lanes. And I'll get that into the next slide. But what actually happened, for a few reasons I'll get to soon, is that we started to see more Azir and more LeBlanc. Now, as a concept, you guys really need to understand that Azir and LeBlanc, champions like Azir and LeBlanc, always come into meta in very high threat jungle metas, purely because they have escape. They have um, insane dashes. Especially LeBlanc, Azir has been kind of 50-50 in the sense that, yes, he has a dash, but it used to cost so much mana, and it used to just be really... Um, he just uh, used to not win mid matchups, so he couldn't really be picked. But given the buffs and Halo Blades and people realizing you can play him very aggressively, um, he did start to uh, pick up a lot of popularity. But more specifically, LeBlanc. The reason being is that if you're a champion like Rek'Sai, Lee Sin, or Elise, who wants to set up ganks or at least generate threat on the mid laner so these guys can push and roam... That just doesn't work versus LeBlanc because she can trade aggressively with her Q and E. She doesn't even have to use her W aggressively or, you know, because she has the, the capability of her W, these junglers don't want to waste time by coming mid because she can just escape so easily and she's very hard to lock down. Then what happened um, now that these champions more became meta, then we started to see more Corky as a counter or a response into Azir, and especially the poke build, because Azir's not really good into poke. Lissandra as a counter to LeBlanc, and Victor in, in here as well as a decent response to Azir as well. And then what happened over time, I don't know this specific moment in time, but then the jungle meta started to shift. And I think it's a combination of slow buffs, to full clear junglers um, and things like that. But more importantly, these sort of champions, if they don't get those early kills and you're not able to get those, you know, generate that threat, you basically become useless. So I think as the meta shifted into more like Victor, Azir and things like that, the junglers were like, well, screw you. I I'm not going to play for mid anymore. I'm just going to play to full clear. Um, and then over time... Um, these started to become more and more popular. People realized how good full clearing was and how far ahead of the enemy jungler you can get if they don't get those early ganks off. So if someone picks like Rek'Sai or Elise and Olaf gets a full clear or even all these champions get a full clear without anything happening, they get ridiculously far ahead. And obviously there were some jungle changes in the mix there, but very simplified, that's kind of what happened in my opinion. Then I feel like we're heading into a different meta. I think right now we're transitioning slowly over here where champions like Syndra are great because they're decent into all... Like Zoe and Syndra are great into all of these champions, like in terms of just 1v1. And the great thing about Syndra specifically and Cassiopeia and Zoe is that they're all good into these very low threat champions. So the way it works, mid lane is always in tandem considered with the jungler. So you couldn't play these these mid laners before because these junglers were the meta and they kind of counter these ones and it's like a, a merry-go-round. But now that these junglers are in the meta, it feels really good to play Syndra because back in the day, as we know if you've watched my Syndra video, one of the biggest counters to Syndra is hard engage. So when I was a head coach and we used to draw Syndra back in the day, my mid laner would always say, I hate versing like Rek'Sai and all these gr aggressive threat junglers because I can't use my E aggressively and I feel like I can't, I'm just going to get outscaled, I'm just going to die to ganks, I can't walk into river. But now that you're it's versing Nidalee, Graves, Kindred, Olaf, all these very low threat champions who are very linear, Syndra has a ball. It's awesome to play Syndra because there's no dive threat. They're all very linear. It's easy to kite. It's easy to self-peel. Exact same for Cassio. Cassio can get away with a lot of matchups or a lot of games that he wouldn't have otherwise. 
she sorry she wouldn't have otherwise um because of the jungle meta and Cassio specifically is very good, and why I've highlighted is very good into dash champions. So, like, very good into a lot of these jungle champions at the moment. And that's why I think we're seeing a lot of Cassio. And she actually has one of the highest win rates in solo queue at the moment, believe it or not. Go to OPGG and check out Sorted by Win Rate. And Cassio, I believe, is one of the, the highest win rate champions, even though that doesn't make sense with what you would think would be good in solo queue, because what you think is good in solo queue is, you know, the Romas, like Echo and Talon, but I actually think Cassio has a higher win rate in solo queue than Talon and Echo and all these champions, which then, this is where the conundrum is starting to form, is like, what do we play? And this is where I think it's weird and very situational in the sense that you can play these very aggressive roaming champions in certain games, but you can also play these scaling champions in certain games, with, which kind of reiterates what my point was before in the previous slide with the with the Zhao Hu and Showmaker. They play one game, they play Lucian mid, or Kiana, or Rumble, or Galio. Then the next game they play Corky, or, you know, or Zoe, or Cassio, and they do equally fine. Because they're, I think they're thinking about the jungle matchup, they're thinking about the pace within that specific game. Because I feel like, at the moment, there's certain junglers that don't understand, they haven't fully moved into this very, like, full clear oriented, um, you know, you know, tempo jungle meta. And then conversely, it's the other way around. Some of these uh, haven't moved back to this one when they, so for example, a player who plays a lot of Nidalee or Graves, uh, when they see certain champions, they probably should adapt and play more aggressive champions to complement their aggressive mid laner. So it turns into, it gets a little bit complicated here, but then what I'm starting to see, um, and it's what some mid laners are starting to play, is like Lulu mid. I've seen actually a bunch of Lulu mid with unsealed spellbook, which says to me, okay, so now some of the mid laners are picking up on the, on the jungle meta. They're seeing that they have things like Graves and Kindred in their games. Um, and that's where Lulu really comes into play. That's where more of that supportive approach as a mid laner really comes into play. So you might see more Karma mid. And this happened in season... Oh, it might have been mid-season 9 or even season 8 where Faker just picked... They picked like... No, it was season 7, 100% because... Um, or season 8 or season 7 where Faker, they just picked like Lulu... They just picked like Karma mid with like Kindred or like... Um, they just pick Karma mid because it's really hard to punish and the it's more of like a jungle oriented meta, whatever it was. That's what you see, like Lulu, Karma come back, Oriana might come back. Um, to be honest, might you might even see a lot more Galio because it is quite supportive as well. Um, but a lot of these more, you know, facilitating uh, mid picks. Now let's go a little bit deeper, guys, and add a bit more context onto that previous slide. Now, mid is a very unique role. It's very, very strange. It's strange because you simultaneously can impact every other role on the map because of two things. How short the lane is, so it's really easy to get push and move. But more importantly, you're in the dead center of the map. You're in the middle. So a few steps, you're in the jungle. A few more steps, you're in bot lane. On the flip side, you can go top lane really, really easily. But because you're in the middle of the map, the downside is that your lane can be influenced incredibly easily. The support can come roam to your lane. The jungler can gank you really easily. There's so many access points that can go over the raptor wall. There's river access. There's ramp access. The top, the top laner can come flank you. A set can come from behind your tower and ult you out of the tower. There's so many ways to die in that sense as well. But compare that with top lane and bot lane. Let's just say you get counterpicked in top lane. Because the lane is so long... Your lane can be a living hell. Your life can be a living hell because they freeze outside the tower and the cost of getting that, that wave unfreezed by your jungler or your mid lane coming to help you comes at a massive cost because let's just say you're playing top, um, you get counterpicked, they freeze the lane outside their tower and you say, jungle, can you come help me? So the jungler come helps you. But what happens, the jungler shows top, which leaves your bot lane completely exposed. So both the side lanes, counterpick means a lot in top and it means a lot in bot lane. But the, but again, there's a there's an argument to be made that mid lane counterpick also means a lot because if you can get push and move off mid, um, you can influence so many roles. You can go everywhere on the map. You can invade the jungle, set up a pick. You can get deep vision. You can dive sides. There's so many things you can do. So it's very fickle and there's a lot of ways to view mid lane. And this is why I think mid lane is influenced massively by the strength in the me in a specific patch of the side laners. Now let's look at how specific OP champions in other roles influence the way the mid lane meta actually pans out over time. 
Now, what we saw in week one, week two of the NALCS, we saw a, a bunch of Aphelios, a bunch of Senna. People were starting to realize how strong fasting Senna was with Tarm, making Tarm incredibly strong. Senna doesn't need farm, just scaling up, getting those, those souls or whatever they're called. Um, and what we realized and what teams realized that it was a very bot-centric meta. And Aphelios has been nerfed like, what, three or four times, and it's still incredibly strong. Like, the champion is... Still strong, um, just kind of shows how OP that champion was at the time. And then when, when teams realize that it's a bot-centric meta, the other roles have to adapt. So what we saw was that we saw a lot more tanks in the top lane. We saw a lot of Ornn. And in the jungle, we saw a lot of Sejuani, and we also saw a lot of Trundle as a counter to that Sejuani. But more importantly, Trundle as well is very tanky and acts as a lot of self-peel for this bot lane. Then, so people realize, okay, we're not going to be able to shut down these very tanky members. They're scaling way too quickly. We're not going to be able to end the game super fast. So we, we said goodbye to a lot of these, you know, early um, pressure-oriented mid laners because they're not really generating threat anymore. A Rumble doesn't have any threat on Senna Tarm. Or Kiana doesn't have much threat. Lucian Mid definitely doesn't have any threat. And especially combined with an Ornn and a Trundle and all these champions. So what happened was that the mid lane meta had to evolve. This is when we saw a lot more Azir and a lot more Corky, right? Corky as a response to the Azir, but vice versa, two um, tank shred champions with plenty of range, plenty of self-peel, so they can still operate in the game without just getting one shot and scaling nicely, because that's what we, we saw. We saw mid lane was more of an isolated 1v1, bot lane was kind of scaling, and it was more of just played around objectives. And Azir and Corky are very, very good around objectives. And specifically, this is why we saw the Muramana Corky build, which is a lot more focused on poke, because that build scales very, very nicely. Once you get to Muramana Triforce, um, your poke's really, really good, which answers Azir nicely, but more importantly, around objective fights is super, super clean. But then, then we saw, and I think where we are right now, there's been a bunch of changes, a bunch of patches that have really tried to nerf Senatarm, Aphelios, all these champions. We're starting to see less Ornn. People started to cotton on, pick a lot more Aurelia. Um, to shred through that set, things like that with Bork. We saw a lot more Bork changes to shred through all this front line. So this is where these champions starting to become less useful as well because you can't really play Azir and Corky into these high threat Bork champions anyway. Um, and, and between the jungle changes, the way the meta's shifting, we're seeing a lot more full clear junglers. And this is where I'm starting to get a little bit unsure about the way the mid lane is, the mid lane meta's panning, panning out, sorry, because like... You've got champions like Cassio that, like I said before, operate very well into champions with dashes and champions with very linear engage. And champions like Syndra in the sense that they isolate, they they love the isolated 1v1. And because these champions aren't necessarily gank oriented, any lane that's isolated 1v1, Syndra loves it. Um, but then on the flip side, you've got champions like Zoe, who can, you know, combine well with a lot of these champions because Zoe offers a lot of CC. They land that bubble, lands it into a spear or a full combo into the um, into the Graves combo, whatever. Zoe also has a lot of small micro interactions and micro synergies with these champions. So again, I feel like the, right now the mid lane meta is... It's up in the air. I don't know what's going to happen. I, and I and what we're going to do next in the next slide is quickly talk about why and some of the questions I, I tend to ask myself to try and figure out where this mid-meta is going to head over the next one or two months. So a few things I like to think about firstly is will the mid lane just be more of a supportive role for the jungler and priority I'm not going to say the word, but you kind of get what I'm saying there. Um, but yeah, so what, I'm, what I've seen so far is because the game has been from jungles, we're seeing so much Graves at a full clearing Olaf, we're seeing Evelyn, we're seeing Nidalee. Does it, will this just mean that mid lane is going to be a supportive, uh, you know, more of a supportive role? Like you're going to see maybe, like I said, more Galio, maybe even Lulu, Oriana, champions that synergize with Kindred Graves like that. Um you know, who knows? Is is just that the way? Is that just the way that mid lane is panning out? I don't know. Um, is is this the reality ever since the eight minute Rift Herald spawn as well and Tower play gold? So maybe mid lane um is always going to be less about the one v one and always more about push and move purely because of um how Rift Herald spawns so much earlier now. And this is a vote in the direction of 
Champion's more like Zoe. Um, and like this kind of goes back to like more like Rumble and Galio and Kiana and things like that because there's going to be those those early team fights. And especially since like Senna Tarm and all that, all those weird things are gone. Maybe it's going to be a vote in the right direction for the more pressure oriented, the Doinby style. I don't know. Uh, you got to take that into account. Uh, will mid pick be centered around countering the enemy jungle? And this is actually something that I've had success with in solo queue. Is when I see a champion like Evelyn, I'll just pick like Galio or Renekton mid um, if I get a good mid matchup. And it feels like Evelyn just can't play the game. So maybe the way we'll see mid lane pan out is that you will leave mid lane for counter pick to see the enemy jungle. Once you see the enemy jungle, you pick a champion that shuts that jungler down. And so, you know, you can, you, there's, there's champions like Olaf get countered really hard by specific mid champions, like, um, Azir is like a really, really good one. There's a, there's a bunch I can't think of at the top of my head. Um, and like for Eve, there's a lot of big counters, like these tanky champions that they, uh, that she can't burst. So maybe that's the way mid lane's going to pan out. I don't know. Um, uh, will this mean that ADs become more or less strong? Okay. So if we see less mages mid, um, you know, maybe if we see less mages mid, traditionally AD carries get countered by mages. That's just been what's happened in the past. Because assassins, assassins are counters to mages, and mages are counters to ADs. Yes, assassins are also good into ADs, but with correct self peel and correct itemization, assassins aren't as a big of a problem as as mages purely because mages have range. Um, and AD carries don't deal with well with with getting out range. That's why Azir um, shuts down AD carries so incredibly well. Um, try playing Vayne into something like Azir. Like you literally just can't play the game. Um, or oh, sorry, sorry, uh, Vayne into try playing Vayne into Oriana. If you don't have Flash, you can't play the game. It's incredibly hard in mid game. Um, so I don't know what will happen depending on how the mid lane meta will shift. Potentially, this might mean that AD carries get more strong if we're. Um, we're not playing mages and we're just playing utility champions for our jungler. I don't know. Um, and sorry, sorry, this actually means if we're playing champions like Rumble and things like that, and Galio, this sometimes means that AD carries get more strong because Galio gets countered by a lot of AD carries and Rumble gets countered by a lot of AD carries if those dives don't get, don't, um, don't work in the early game. Um, another one, will they nerf jungle? So if they nerf things like Phase Rush and Nimbus Cloak, um, in the job for junglers and maybe jungle clear speeds or jungle XP and bring back more power to, to laners. Um, how this, how will this actually affect mid lane? I don't know. I mean, will this mean that we see, um, will this mean that we see more gank oriented jugglers goes back to Rek'Sai, Lee Sin, Elise, Jarvan, and then we play more gank setup champions mid. We, we, and it goes back to like the end of 2019, um, FPX style of playing the game. And what I've actually found, which is super, super interesting, and I don't know if you guys have seen this as well, when I was a head coach for three years, the exact same thing happened every single season. 2017, 2018, 2019. At the start of each season, Riot announced that they're adding way more damage into the game. So at the start of the season, we see more champions like Aurelia, Camille, top lane, in terms of top lane, Riven. We see a lot of damage carry-oriented top laners. In terms of mid lane, it's always like very early game, um, just pressure, a lot of damage, not many tanks in the game. Now, as the meta shifts and as we get closer and closer and closer to worlds, what I saw every single time is that Orn always comes back, Maokai and Sion always find a way back into the meta. Um, you always, for some reason, see like AoE, big AoE team fight front to back champions as well it always goes back to this front to back meta in, around worlds 20 2019 last year was a little bit different but 2017 2018 100% but for 95% of the teams even that was the case for 2019 as well just not fpx and the chinese teams so i don't know if that's going to happen as well maybe riot are still slowly working towards again the front to back bringing back tanks into the game, probably going to nerf Bork at some point soon in the future, mid-split too, and make it... Because they want to see all those team fights at Worlds. That's what people love. But I don't know. Maybe they want to see more kills. Maybe the game's just evolved. I don't know. Um, and note, guys, kind of like what I was saying before, the most optimal picks in mid lane in each meta stem from the most OP thing. And actually not even just mid lane in general. So in each meta, in my opinion... The way the meta, it all revolves, like if you think of it, if you think about the meta all revolving around one thing, it's always around the most OP thing on that patch. So when when, when Riot released a new patch, when they released Senna, or when they released Aphelios, Aphelios was really OP, so everything revolves around that. So what happens, um, people counter Aphelios with this, and then that becomes the meta. 
um or Orn becomes really OP, then like you know, then certain champs come in as a result of that, and then that forms the meta. Generally, your job is to always identify what is the most OP thing. And then that can allow you to foresee what's going to happen. Because then that's going to change. That's going to get nerfed. That's going to bring this. And like I said before, if we go all the way back, if we go all the way back here, guys, this is, what, is exactly what's going to happen again. Maybe we're just, at, we're just at the start of the cycle. It might go all the way back to here. That's my theory. I think my theory, this is not going to last. This whole farming jungle thing, it's going to go back to all the way over here. We're going to go back to Elise, Rex, I, Elise in. Go back to the pressure mid laners, and it's going to go rinse, repeat around by the time Worlds comes out. I mean, I could be wrong, but that's just my theory anyway. Now, this is the other conundrum that I've been contemplating over the past few months. And, and again, as a result of all this information, I've been dwelling in my mind. It feels like there's just three types of players in high elo. Very simplified, like excluding pro players, but for the high elo players, even, even to be honest, even pro players, most of them as well, feels like there's three types of players and three ways to reliably climb. Number one, there's the aggressive roam heavy style. This is like champion pools centered around early pressure and early roams. So... As we all know, champions like Talon, Rumble, Fizz, Katarina, Nocturne, Galio, Zed. Now, these are always there. You always see them in high elo, these players, because that style never goes away. It always works in solo queue because of how chaotic the game is. You can reliably get... Because um, people aren't going to respect pings all the time. Um, you're going to get people off roll. It's super easy to pick them off. Um, it's just always going to be a thing. So I feel like this is the only thing that does make sense. But then there's been this new style. There's two other styles I've seen that I... Because I, I always thought this number one was the best way to play the game in terms of solo queue, but it just hasn't been the case. Number two here is Calculated Scaling Assassins. Now, this is where a lot of misconceptions lie, and I want to... I kind of want to clarify a bunch of things here because I've had questions in the Discord that I feel like would be answered by giving a little bit more context here. So, I kind of feel like a lot of people view these champions incorrect. I've realized this this year, is that champions like Silas, Diana, Echo, a lot of these assassins, if you farm incredibly well in the early game, you play very patient, you get to your first item, item and a half, whatever, you don't, it's a, it's a misconception that you get outscaled, that you have to do things at level 6, you have to go in, you have to heavy trade. A lot of these champions, if you farm incredibly efficiently, it's like my pro player insight video when I went over that game of Showmaker playing um, Echo. He played incredibly calculated. He took TP. He came back for tempo bases. He, he got really, really farmed. And then just one shot the AD carry. Like, that's a genuine way of playing the game at the moment. And this, I find right now, is one of the scariest ways to play the game. I find these are the scariest players to verse. The very competent... Echo players, the very competent Aurelia players, these players that know how to farm really well, minimize the early laning phase, don't feel the need to overcompensate, go for crazy solo kills and do this. Just play calculated. They end up being such a menace as the mid game turns around that you can't deal with them. As soon as this, this Aurelia gets like, you know, gets Bork Wits End or Bork Sterex Gage, you can't deal with it. If Echo, once he gets Lich Bane Protobelt, you can't deal with him. Um, but big, the biggest mistake I see is that they don't value farm. You guys in solo queue, you're not valuing farm. You're you're playing the game way too fast. Your deaths are all through the roof um, and you're playing the game too fast. So try it out. I mean, I don't know. And, and this is something that's been given me success on Syndra. It's like, I always felt like I had to play super fast, but that's just, and I'll get to this in a second, but I've just found that in terms of solo queue, farm is OP more than ever. And I don't know why, or maybe it's purely because of the way the jungle meta is shifting. So it's less about ganking mid and ganking in general. It's more about being strong in mid game. I don't know, but it's just something I've, just, I've been really thinking about. I'd love to get your thoughts, guys, in the comments section. This is just my interpretation in high yellow games. I don't know, um, but I just found that quite, quite interesting. And then this is where I've really been bamboozled. This is what's boom my mind so then there's the control mage approach and i always thought that this didn't work like i always thought that like these two styles would be the best but at the moment you still see high elo one trick casios who get like they're like 800 lp casio only and they can make it work and i've i spectated their games and there's players on my server the exact same thing and the way they play they play corky they play azir they play casio vega 
they they minimize extremely well. But the thing, the difference is, they are so competent on their champion that when they do, say the enemy does get a roam playoff or whatever happens, they they know how to make up for it by playing flawlessly in mid game. So as soon as Cassio gets, you know, um, Archangels, it gets to that, that one fight. She gets one or two kills. It's done. She can take over the entire game. Exact same with Vega, um, all these champions. There are players in each server that I've seen that are high low, only playing control mages extremely patiently. And I don't think I've ever seen this in a meta where you can play all these styles and have the same levels of success. I don't know. I haven't seen it. But generally, there's two subcategories. There's the players who play these slow these pl so ch slow champions very reliably. And then there's the mages that more are more gank-oriented. Um, again, there's always high elo Zoe players. Zoe player, Zoe players are the most scary ones, in my opinion. There's like one in Korea who's been like 1k LP. He's just a random player. He's not even a pro player. He plays Zoe every game, blind pick, any game, doesn't matter. And he's 1k LP. He d d and his games are insane. Like, he's actually someone I want to do a video on. Um, and it just shows, because Zoe's such a good solo queue champion, because he can be played in that way, slow scaling, or he can play super aggressive, fast, dive sides, you can do everything on Zoe. So, I want to get your thoughts, guys. What do you think is the best way to climb solo queue? I don't know. I can't even answer that question right now, because I feel like everything works. Um, share with me what you think, and be interesting to kind of, um, you know, let, let that dwell and, uh, yeah, get a, get a bit of insight there. So what I want to do now is go through this, the four-step process to identifying and creating your own champion pool, because I want to clarify a few things. I wasn't really happy with what I did before in the past with that last video, so I really want to tie it all together quite nicely. So step one, guys, you've got to identify your, your natural inclination. So everyone has a way that they prefer to play the game, or a way that feels comfortable for them to play the game. So for some people, they love melee assassins, they love Echo, they love Diana, they love playing it quite aggressively. Um, some people like to play long-range mages. I, like me, I used to love playing Zerith, Velkos, I used to love Orianna, all these very long-range like champions I just loved. I loved mages. So the theme is, guys, um, you need to think about what's fun and you need to think about what's comfortable. Now, the way to do this is just play a bunch of them, play all of them, and listen to your feelings. What do you find fun? What do you feel comfortable? Does this feel uncomfortable? Does this feel comfortable? Uh, play a bunch, a bunch of different champions, feel what's best for you. And again, no one should tell you what's fun for you. That's the, that's the thing that you need to figure out for yourself. And trust me, fun is important because... When the game gets hard, because what happens in League of Legends? If we view like champion mastery, that this is like 100% playing the... You can't really play a champ to 100%, but let's just say you play a champ to 100% theoretically, and this is like 0%. When you get to about like 70% or like even maybe 80%, 75 to 80%, this last 20% requires you just loving the, like genuinely loving the champion or having fun because it's painful that that last 20 percent to take that champion to the next level to get that champion mastery you have to put in a ridiculous amount of hours and you're not going to do that if you just don't find the champion fun you have to find the champion fun and it sounds ridiculous but trust me that is why champions like um you know you see those aurelia one tricks and they love aurelia and they get to that level because they love the champ. They can play it day in, day out, and, and push the limits and get to that level, um, you know, more than the average player. So, step two, guys. You need to account for the current level of competence at the game. Now, if you're iron or bronze or silver, particularly, like gold plus, I feel like you can kind of play everything. But br iron, bronze, and silver, at these levels, what I've found is that Players struggle with straight character control. They literally aren't comfortable with the mouse and the keyboard clicking confidently, hitting skill shots, just basic character control. So this is why playing champions like Annie or Diana, Malzahar, Vega, very simple kits, um, you know, champions that are very easy to last hit with. So Annie can just last hit with Q very easily. What it can actually do is because the these elements of the game that you need to get down pat, you don't need to think of it really too much anymore. Um, it frees you up to just to get more comfortable, more free flow. Um, and once you play these champions enough and you play them well enough and you just get the basic mechanical element of the game down pat, you should be easily kind of getting out of silver. And then once you get to high silver gold, then you can start to maybe diversify and pick 
some more complex champions that you wouldn't have otherwise been able to play because you know how to control your character very well. So you need to take this into account when creating your champion pool. I don't want to see you picking Yasuo or, you know, some Azir and all these crazy champions if you're like silver or bronze and iron especially. Now, step three, you got to determine your goal, guys. Like, everyone has differing goals when playing the game. I'm not going to give you advice to do this specific champion pool and do all this if you just want to play for fun. So it's very important that you determine your goal. What are you trying to get out of it? What are you trying to get out of this champion pool that you're creating? Are you just playing to get to silver? Are you playing just to get to gold? Are you trying to be a pro player? I don't know. So the first one generally is just long-term improvement or and improving fundamentals. So you want to improve over the long term. Like you're in this for the long term. You want to get, maybe get challenger or master here, grandmaster in the future. You're silver or gold at the moment. Um, and you, and, and you know, you're playing very patient. You're very patient. You're willing to put in the work. This is where I would recommend, um, that you would have a small champion pool and you play champions that allow you to learn the fundamentals quite well. So avoiding those like very cheat ELO champions that don't allow you to learn fundamentals. Like you want to avoid Katarina, Vlad, Yasuo, Kassadin. Yes, you can add these into your pool later on as a niche pick. But what I've found is that if you pick those, if you pick up those champions early on in silver, gold, things like that, you start to rely on them. You get a bit of ELO and you don't want to go back. Um, and it, they're not good for learning things like mana conservation, um, wave control, all these like very um, roaming things like that. It's very hard to um, learn on these champions. And also champions suited for your elo. If you're silver, again, like I said before, you shouldn't be picking super complex champions. Two, if you're maybe in it for short-term elo gains, maybe you made a bet with your friend, or maybe you're quitting at the end of the se season and you just want a specific elo, then maybe that's where you might be interested in one-tricking, or maybe you would only pick champions that stomp solid queue. Like I said, you might want to just play Cat, Vlad, and Cassidy, and get your short-term elo gain, and then do whatever you want to do, quit the game, or what you're... I don't know what you're trying to do. So, or maybe go back to your normal games and go back to TFT. I don't know. Uh, if that's for you, then that's probably what I'd recommend. Um, or if you're just playing for fun, you can just play whatever champion, whenever, have a large champion pool. It really doesn't matter. Again, you got to think about what your goal is. And I'm not here to tell you um, specifically what to play. I'm just giving you the principles behind how I decide what you should put in your pool. And you should decide that on your own. And a lot of people come to me and they haven't really thought about what their goal was. And at the end of the day, maybe they think, you know what? I just want to play for fun. I, I should just play whatever. Uh, something to think about. And then for step four, now before we decide, we also have to be aware of the following concepts. Number one, diversified pool. Now this is something I do want to clarify. So I want to get into the strengths and weaknesses within this specific topic because um, I get a lot of questions about this. So strengths. The strength of having a device, di diversified pool, sorry, is that it actually increases carry potential in a wider range of games. What you'll find is that there's some games, say you have a very, maybe you have a very one-dimensional pool. Maybe you have like Diana, you have Diana, Echo, and um, Cassidy. Yeah, like Diana, Echo, Cassidy. And you're versing like, like a, a full tanky team composition. You're versing like a you know, an on mid or whatever you're versing mid or a set mid or whatever, uh, very tanky team comp, um, or maybe even versing, you, you, you've got a full AP comp and you don't have any AD champion in your pool, whatever it is, if you don't have a diversified pool, you're going to find some games are literally just unwinnable. It's going to be very, very hard for you to win. Um, that is something to think about. And I feel like if you have a diversified pool, we have one good against frontline, you have one AD champion, you have one champion that spikes early, one champion that spikes late, whatever. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help you out over a longer, a wider range of games. Um, it also allows for better understanding of the game. What I've also realized, this is for me, kind of because I was a very one-dimensional player uh, back in the day. I only played majors, right? But when I, I was an Oriana, Velko, Zereth player, and when I picked up Zed for the first time, I actually got I actually got better at my mages because I understood the game better through a different lens, and I feel like having a diversified pool can really um, level up your understanding of the, of the game. Not only of how to play your mages better, it allowed me to play my mages better, but it, it made me think about how I can counter assassins better because now I knew what it felt like to play the game through those champs. If that makes sense, um, and it's also crucial for clashing competitive players. Um, because if you if you want to go competitive 
you know, you're just gonna, if you're a one trick or you have a very small pool, it's gonna be incredibly easy to get banned out and allows you to complement your team composition as well. So if you see your team composition is, um, even in solo queue, you can complement your team composition in little ways just by saying, oh, okay, we don't have any AD, we need AD. We don't have any, um, you know, everyone's spiking in the early game. I should also pick something that probably spikes in the early game. Otherwise, if I pick a scaling champion here, it won't really make too much sense, that sort of thing. There's weaknesses though, guys. We've got to understand them. It is harder to learn, guys, due to natural inclination. So it was incredibly hard for me to pick up a champion like Zed at the beginning. I entered a lot of games. I, I lost so many games because it felt so against my nature. I it just didn't make sense to me when I did this. It was like in season four or whatever it was. It felt so weird. Um, so it can be very, very hard and painful. Um, and this may decrease short-term ELO gains. You might have a lot of trouble... So you might have to do it on a whole separate account. I probably recommend that you don't do it on your main at all because it will come at a cost. Now, one thing to note, guys, is that this isn't for everyone. So it is fine to all in on your identity as a player. If you are an assassin player and you do want to have only assassins in, in your pool, that is completely fine. My only concern is if you want to get um, you know, picked up, you want to play competitive, you want to play clash, you want to be a pro player, you want to get very, very high elo, you want to get past master tier, you want to get into like grandmaster challenger, that sort, of, that sort of thing, then you probably should diversify your pool. But again, that's not what everyone wants to do. You can be an only assassin player and get diamond one master tier. You can do that. It's not a big deal. I'm just saying it might be a little bit harder. But if that's what feels comfortable for you, you can go for it. This is just my opinion. I know plenty of players that only play Assassins. They only play like Aurelia, Camille, and they get to like high elo. They can't, they do that. And um, so I want you to remember that it's not for everyone, okay? If you can do diversified pools, then go for it. Don't don't force it too hard, okay? As long as you're understanding the strengths and weaknesses. Um, blind picks, it is important to have blind picks, but it really does depend on the elo and the meta you're within. Again, I can't, I, I'm not just going to sit here, I can't tell you why, or like, all the blind picks, what it's going to be in the future. Right now, I feel like the best blinds are Echo and Syndra, just because of the way the meta is, just because of what's strong and what's weak. But if Syndra gets nerfed, or Echo gets nerfed, you know, they might not be the best blind picks anymore. So, and again, something to keep in mind, guys, that blind picks aren't really as important below gold. Like, gold and below, you can pick anything. Like, I feel like... I could blind pick Oriana every single game in gold, even in probably even in platinum, to be honest, because I'm I'm pretty good at Oriana, but like people overcomplicate it and they stress too much about blind picking champions. But people don't have the champion mastery or the ability to the wave control and all these things to counter your champion anyway at that level. So I wouldn't really worry too much about having reliable blind picks until like platinum, really. I don't think it's a massively big deal. And so you gotta know the small champion pool advantages. Um, it helps with champion mastery because if you're playing a... Sh I've said this a lot of times, but I really need to reiterate because it's such an important point. Is that, let's just say you have a champion pool of three. Three champs. Now, if you think about it, each of those three champions, you're going to be versing, what, another, like... There's, what, how many champions in the game? 150 or whatever it is. So, let's say 149... Oh, okay, and how many mid laners are in the game? Say there's... Let's just say off the top of my head, 50. So, there's 50 mid lane champions in the game. Well, I'm gonna. I have to know 49 individual matchups for that champion. But compare that with if I had and times that by three. So 49 was that it's around 150ish of specific matchups or iterations of matchups that I need to understand. If I had a champ pool of six, I have to double that. That's what 300. That's 300 potential matchups, whatever, and it get way way bigger. And that's not even taking into account how those champions interact with differing junglers. You can kind of just see how big the numbers get and how unreliable it will be to get champion mastery if you're playing a large amount of champions. Um, it allows for muscle memory of micro elements so you can focus on macro and map play. Now, this is a really, really big one. So again, you know what I was talking about before. This is 100% and this is 0%. Now, the first 50%, right? It, when you're going from 0% to 50%, that whole time, it's going to use all your mental energy just focusing on the micro and the like... The specifics of the champion. Now, once you start to get into the 60, 70 percent, a lot of the stuff of the micro element of the champion are going to become muscle memory. So you're not going to have to think about how to hit your abilities. You're not going to have to think about all these things. So what's going to happen? Your brain power is freed up to think about side lane awareness, macro play, uh, creative ganks, um, all these these things that you wouldn't or jungle tracking. All these very you know, not micro element things. You can think about all these macro element 
macro oriented things because your brain power is freed up. So if you play a lot of different champions to 40% or 50%, you're never going to really be able to improve all these macro elements because you're not going to have the brain power, the energy to actually do it. So that is something to think about as well. Now I just want to quickly cover an example of a diversified pool because I get a lot of questions asking Curtis, what does a diversified pool look like? What are the categories that I need to fill? And how can I create one for myself? So Overall, guys, there's four different categories. The first category you need to cover is have just have one champion that is blindable, very flexible, that you can pick when you're just basically first pick. Generally, it's good to have a champion that's good into heavy frontline, an AD champion, and then fourth one is just having a fast-paced champion. Now, starting on the, the top left-hand corner here for my blindable, Syndra's a really bread-and-butter one. Echo's also blindable. Zoe's somewhat blindable. Generally, these are champions that only require one ban, or they're so flexible that they can even minimize poor matchups. Orianna is another one of these, but in the specific meta at the moment is a bit tricky past Platinum. But in Gold and Below, Orianna also works. But the beautiful thing about Syndra, like I said in my video, is that you can play it really fast and aggressive. You can play it super slow and scaling. You can take TP, you can take Exhaust, you can take Ignite. There's so many ways to play it. The exact same as Echo. You can play Ignite fast, or you can take TP and play slow for tempo bases. So you just want one reliable, blindable pick. I think it is also pretty nice to have one tank trading champion like Victor, Zero, or Casio, because if you do versus a very heavy frontline champion and you're playing something like Echo and you only have like Echo Dyna in your pool, you are going to have a very tough time. And some of those games just aren't going to be winnable. Um... So I like having one tank shred champion, very good, very scaling oriented, um, quite slow, good into heavy frontline. Um, AD champion, now, I say this a lot, but it, it you don't need to have one. I just think it's nice past D4. Once you get past Diamond, I think it is nice to just have one, you know, champions like Nocturne mid, Kiana, Talon, whatever. I am going to be doing a video on Nocturne mid because I do think it's quite nice at the moment. Um, so stay tuned. I was actually going to work on that today, but because of my internet's booms, I couldn't do that. But it is what it is. And then I like to have one faster pace champion to round out the your scaling one. Now, the reason these ones are important is because um, if you see in the draft, you've got like Elise, you've got Rek'Sai, these aggressive junglers, you've got very fast, heavy trading side lanes like Riven versus like Kale Top, all these champions like that. You want to play the game fast, in my opinion. So it's good to have a champion that complements those picks. Echo, Zoe works, Diana, Rumble, any of these champs, it really, really works. Again, this is just my opinion on what a diversified pool looks like. It's Again, it's not always absolutely essential. It's just nice if you can do it. Um, and that's just that's just my take on things. So I just want to quickly cover one thing. I get asked a lot, what do you do when you're first pick? And I, it's just more to it than having a blindable pick. So when I'm first pick in a draft, guys, these are the things I consider. I consider the hovers on my team. So I like to look at damage spread. I like to look, so say I'm seeing a Nidalee, I see a bit of AP. Um, I'm looking at micro interactions. If I have a Gragas, you know, if I had Yasuo in my pool, that would be a, a thumbs up. Um, CC, I don't want to stack CC, so if I see my uh, my team hovering Ash, um, Sejuani, I don't want to pick something like Lissandra because it's get, or TF, because we're going to have so much um, single target CC, then they just get value cleansers, which, again, these are all things I look at. I also look at the bands on both teams, and this is where understanding your champion's bands or identity really comes into play. So... If I know my champion's identity really well, I know exactly what bands, I should know what bands are great for me. So if I'm playing Orianna, you know, no, so for example, I see like Cassidy ban, Yasuo ban, Echo ban for some reason, then it's actually, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I can just pick Ori. Like worst case scenario, I verse like a Gali or something, but it's not as bad as versing an Echo or a Yasuo or something like that. So I know my champions really well. I know what, what champions I look for. It's the same thing with TF. If I see Cassidy and Yasuo and like maybe uh, Echo ban, I'm like, oh, great. I can easily pick TF this game. It doesn't really matter what they pick. So it is very important that you know what bans allow you to pick your champions in your pool uh, on both teams. It's very important to think about that. Um, and it, even like bands that aren't directly related to your 1v1 matchup. So if I'm playing, I'm looking to play TF and then I see Olaf ban, again, that's another vote in the right direction as well. Um, blind pickable champs, again, that's where you got to have your blind pickable champs that comes into play. But remember guys, champion comfort is better than what looks on paper, what looks right on paper. So you know what? Like 
what people, a big hole people get themselves, dig themselves into is that they see, you know, they have, oh, the, like, this would be awesome. This is like the perfect Yasuo game. If like, you know, even though I'm like not, not that good at Yasuo, but trust me, this is such a good Yasuo game. I just don't like that mindset because 95% of the time, champion comfort matters way more and compensates for the, the, the perfect pick. Like, if you just picked what you were good at, even though that maybe wasn't the best pick, you're going to perform so much better than just having that perfect counter pick. That's just, that's just my take on it as well. So these are all the things. So keep in mind, when you're blind, when your first pick, you should consider all of this information, not just, oh, okay, I'm blind, I should pick Syndra. You've got to look at the bands, you've got to look at the hovers, you've got to look at all this information to decide what is the best pick for that game. Now, I get a lot of questions in the Discord and the YouTube comments asking me, Curtis, what are your thoughts on one-tricking? Do you think it's worth doing? If I sh should one-trick a champion, who should I play? Uh, what are the advantages, disadvantages, etc.? So I thought I'd kind of go over that in just one slide so I can really answer that question once and for all. So the first one, we'll actually start with advantages on the left-hand side. It's actually easier to achieve champion mastery, like I said before. It's very, very difficult to go from like 80% to 100% when in terms of competence on a champion. But if you're playing that champion all the time, like that's all you're thinking about, that's all you're playing, you're not having to think about counter picks, anything at all, you're going to get to that 100% much easier, which can give you a short term boost in rank because, again, most people in low elo don't have champion mastery. So it can be a really quick boost like platinum or even diamond four one tricking, but it's going to be very hard from that point on, depending on the champion you do one trick. Um, allows you to focus on macro elements. Like I said, because you're already going to be at like 70% competence on that champion, all your energy is not going to be focused on the micro elements of the game. You're going to be able to think of all the macro elements because you just know the ins and out of that champion. You know how to play the lane. You know how to do the combos really well. It's super comfortable to you. You can focus on roaming, side lane awareness, creative plays, tempo bases, jungle tracking, all that sort of thing. Um, you can find ways to creatively win or minimize hard matchups. So it's like that that Dunn guy from, I believe he's from NA, the Dunn, the Victor one trick, or whatever. He can play matchups with Victor with creative rune pages, creative um, usage of abilities, maybe maxing certain abilities or playing the wave in a certain way, building certain things. He knows how to minimize or even win hard matchups. Now, that's just not going to be the case for 90 nine percent of plays playing that matchup or playing that champion so um when you do one trick a champion you're going to be able to find ways to win matchups because humans as, as a as a concept we're very good at solving problems if there's a problem and we really want to solve it we will find a way to get it done um it can be like i said it can be better for short-term elo gains because of champion mastery because of all these things you can focus on more macro elements and creative ways to win matchups and it can be incredibly fun and great for montages so if you're interested in making montages or youtube content or whatever people love watching one tricks because they can do cool flashy stuff now for the disadvantages it can create a very one-dimensional view of the game i've seen it so many times where you know you get a player they one trick a champion to d1 or d4 or even master tier and then they want to like they want to pick up new champs, or maybe their champ just sucks now, the meta doesn't suit it, whatever. They have a very one-dimensional view of the game, and it's so hard for them to pick up other champs. They they can't, they either go all the way back to D4 or Platinum. They, they become, like, just not good players because their view is so biased. They can't get out of that way of viewing the game. And they have all these very deeply ingrained habits that are formed, and it's really hard to change. So sometimes there's no going back, or it takes so long. The process is so painful that people, um, they're like, yeah, screw it. I, I might as well stick with being a one trick. That's my identity. I can't get past that, even though they want to change. Um, it's hard to adapt to meta shifts, because again, if the meta shifts, and you're maybe like a one trick, a ZR, whatever, it's going to be very hard for you to... Um, climb in a specific meta because maybe it's just like a super assassin-esque meta or whatever it is yes you can find ways to creatively win or minimize matchups but it will be very hard um some games will be straight unwinnable like i said if you're a one trick zed um even though there's that zed one trick in korea who's an absolute animal i don't even know how he did that but for 99.99 percent of players um there will be games that will be sh just really really hard to win not like like not 100% unwinnable, but incredibly hard to win because maybe you're full AD. Um, maybe you, again, you're an assassin into a full tanky comp or whatever it is. It's just really, really hard to win. And you, and you got to basically play the champion flawlessly. Like if you make one mistake, you're done. And you basically can never be a competitive or 
pro player um, because, again, you have a one-dimensional view of the game. Your champion pool is really, really bad, and it's going to take you so long to break out of those bad habits, and you basically can't play Clash as well because you're so easy to get banned out. That's the other downside as well. So, thanks for watching, guys. I know this was a bit... It might have been a boring video. I don't know. I, I, like, I kind of wanted to share my thoughts, and you guys wanted to see this sort of thing. Experiment with it. If you don't want to see it, just let me know. Um, if you want to see more stuff like this, just let me know as well. Hopefully my internet's going to get fixed very soon. I can get back into the, the guides and that sort of thing. So I appreciate you guys if you, if you got this far in the video and appreciate all the support, guys. Cheers.